I'm Dan Schatzberg. I work at Meta. I work on the containers team, but I also do a lot of work associated with resource isolation, resource efficiency, and uh, the topic today is going to be SCEDEX, which is the extensible scheduler class. It's a way to write schedulers for Linux. Um, I'm going to get into background motivation, but before I get started, like, how many people have written VPF? How many people have written their own scheduler or edited the Linux kernel scheduler? All right. Smaller set of people. Uh, uh, I'm going to cover both topics uh, uh, and, and how they combine together to make it much easier to change the Linux scheduler, uh, which is something we care a lot about. Um, so very quickly, I'll, I'll cover kind of what is the CPU scheduler, what does it do? Um, very Classically, you have a single core, you may have multiple tasks in Linux terms. I'll, I may use the term thread pretty interchangeably with task, but um, it means the same thing, right? There's some entity that I want to schedule. Um, and the scheduler's job is just sharing the core. You have one physical core, you have multiple things that want to execute as if they are running uh, uh, on their own uh, hardware. And so the scheduler is deciding which task to run next, where they run, all that sort of stuff. Obviously, this simple model uh, uh, has changed a lot in the last you know, 20 plus years. Uh, we have multiple cores, but that's not really that much more trouble. You have, uh, okay, multiple tasks. You may have to move them from core to core depending on whatever's idle. This is, again, the kind of core functionality of the scheduler. Uh, obviously, there's some complexity with moving stuff. If you have caches, you don't always want to move a task around from core to core because some of its data may be hot in the cache. So uh, you want to keep it on the same core. So uh, there's all sorts of penalties for migrating things. And this is just the like very, very, you know, scratching the surface of all the various challenges that are involved in scheduling. There's uh, uh, quite a lot of different problems you care about with scheduling. One is fairness. How do I make sure that each task gets the amount it should? Um, various properties of optimization. I want to make sure to you know, use the system resources pretty well. Make sure the scheduler itself isn't taking too much CPU time and taking away from other stuff. And I want it to work on various different architectures across different workloads for, for all of these different purposes. Um, and this is just a small subset, right? Like uh, power management may be a concern of your scheduler and you would want it to behave differently. Thermal management is another area uh, that I haven't listed here. The scheduler is kind of in some way or another involved in all of these sorts of things. There are a lot of different constraints depending on the environment you run on. Uh, CFS, uh, the, the slides may be a little outdated in a sense, but the CFS has been the kind of default kernel scheduler, so the completely fair scheduler for uh, many years now. Uh, in the last year, it got replaced by EEVDF, which works similarly. There are some differences, but um, I will largely talk about CFS as the kind of uh, uh, been around for a lot longer in Linux. Uh, and this is the, the kind of default scheduling class in Linux. And, and um, it's called you know, a fair weighted virtual time scheduler, which is a, a, a wordy way to describe something that tries to preserve fairness, basically. And, and like largely what it does, it figures out for each task on a core um, how much CPU it, it, uh, it's gotten and scales that proportionally by the amount of weight it has. So if you set niceness on a thread that is changing its weight in some way um, and it's able to scale like, okay, if, if you're supposed to have uh, a, a high weight, then uh, uh, you get more time on the core. And uh, CFS basically just keeps track of how much time it's given everything and uh, uh, make sure that each one gets its proportional share. So I've shown three different examples here, all with equal weights. If you have one task, it gets 100% of the CPU, two tasks, 50%. And this is kind of just the abstraction, right? Uh, obviously, at any one time, a core is running a single task. Uh, CFS is sitting there making sure to, you know, give everyone switch switch threads frequently enough to give everyone their fair share. Uh, it's been around since 2007, so we're very close to the 17-year anniversary of CFS being in the Linux kernel. Um, as I said, uh, over the last year, there's been uh, quite a substantial change here. Uh, to move to EEVDF, but uh, both schedulers are fairly, have a lot of conceptual similarities, right? There's 
effectively a scheduler per core, some load balancing on top, uh, and, and using uh, weighted virtual time as, as a mechanism. Um, the, the, the like history here is pretty important, I think, because it, it like dictates a lot about the structure of CFS and, and Linux scheduling in general. So this is, I think, like a 2007 era, top of the line server CPU you might see, uh, uh, and all, all of its two cores. Um, and uh, uh, what you notice about it, okay, yeah, there's, there's two cores, one L3 cache, and uh, the topology is pretty homogenous. You just have the two cores, right? There's no NUMA properties here necessarily. Um, the uh, migration latencies, the cost of communicating between two cores is like fairly high at this time. Um, so a, a lot of what scheduling was developed around was keeping everything local, right? Like stuff, stuff should run on a single core and stay on that core. And uh, uh, you know, periodically you can do load balancing to make sure your system is well utilized, but um, not a lot of uh, uh, thought beyond that. Um, nowadays you have much more complex hardware to to topologies. I'll use, this is I think AMD terminologies, core complexes uh, and core complex dies, but uh, this kind of chiplet architecture has become common across a number of different uh, hard hardware uh, companies, um, which is to say that you have you know, a far more complicated topology than just number of cores sharing a cache. You have potentially multiple caches on a chip um, and potentially multiple chips in a NUMA uh, uh, system, uh, uh, which creates some, some a lot more complexity here. So uh, kind of now the way I, I typically view it is you have you know, this heterogeneity across the system, different cores having different latency to other cores, and uh, depending on which cores and where those are, uh, uh, some things may be faster or slower than in the past. So you have um, on a die, you may have uh, certain uh, 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 memory access uniformity through the cache to core complexes that may be faster or slower depending on exact number here. So these are two, two fairly recent AMD microarchitectures. Uh, I know the picture is probably too small to see any details, but Zen 2 and Zen 3, if you want to dig into details here. Um, so like, I, I highlight all of that to say like scheduling is, you know, the hardware has changed that puts a lot of pressure on our schedulers to like perform well in, in this kind of shifting landscape. And one place that we struggle a lot with CFS is that it's, it's really difficult to experiment, right? Like I, I run a lot of production workloads at, at, at Meta and I want to see what, what if I change this property of the scheduler, what's going to happen? Um, it's hard, right? I have to like recompile my kernel, I have to reboot. Uh, once the machines reboot, it may take a while before the service is back up and running to its kind of um, ideal performance. Uh, and uh, just a high iteration cycle for any of that makes experimentation really difficult to change the CFS in, in, in the kernel. Um, it's also just generalizable, right? Like the same scheduler needs to work for my Android phone, my laptop, and my data center. Uh, and that, you know, sacrifices performance you know in the name of generalizability right um, and of course just the upstream process of, of working on on the schedulers is challenging you can't regress it across all these different uh, environments there's an understandably high bar for contributions and what it results in is you know a lot of different schedulers scheduler patches end up being maintained out of tree I know at Meta, we, we try to minimize the amount of, of out-of-tree uh, patches we have for the scheduler, but nonetheless, if you know, we can save 1% uh, 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 performance on a workload, we're going to find a way to do that. So uh, uh, th that ends up having to, to be a maintenance cost and something that's difficult for us to often share with others. I'm going to very quickly touch on BPF. This is like not a... a not really a BPF talk, but uh, I will, uh, uh, if you have questions, feel free to stop me at any point and, and just let me let me know. Um, so BPF, like at its core, is like a kernel feature that allows you to run custom code that you've developed in, in the kernel and inject it at, at runtime. Uh, the very early days, it was like a generalizable way. BPF stands for Berkeley Packet Filter. It was a way to um, do packet filtering and, and add custom logic that said, okay, if there's this field in the packet, then do this or something like that. Um, over the last several years, it has evolved into a much, much larger subsystem. 
Um, you can use it for tracing and all sorts of things by sort of attaching to different functions in the kernel and running arbitrary logic and figuring out. Um, and there's some demos earlier today showing showing a bunch of BPF. But um, at its core, you like write C code, you compile that into BPF bytecode, user space loads that into the kernel, and then the kernel is going to verify that your code has a lot of properties that necessarily the, the C compiler didn't catch, right? That you aren't accessing invalid memory, that you eventually terminate a uh, bunch of different properties so that you know with this code running in the kernel, it's not going to crash the whole system. But at a high level, it's like a, a JIT in the compiler, you're able to uh, you know, uh, uh, run arbitrary code inside the kernel. And I'm, I'm getting to what SCEDEX actually is. I realize it's a, a little long in the talk to, to get to the kind of punchline here, but um, SCEDEX is really like, allowing you to implement scheduling policies, right? So what is the actual logic of your scheduler? And implementing those as BPF programs that you can load at runtime. You can change them, reload them. You don't need to reboot your kernel. Uh, there's a whole lot of safety built into the system here. So if you load a bad scheduler policy uh, and suddenly we see that, say, uh, uh, um, you know, a thread is not getting scheduler, scheduled or hasn't been able to run for a while, uh, the core, core system behind it will uh, kind of kick out your scheduler and, and go back to CFS or whatever the, the default scheduler is in the system. So um, the the iteration cycle is like much as you would run any system service or, or kind of user space daemon in the system, you would now write your own scheduler in BPF, load that with the daemon that, that uh, uh, injects the BPF code into the kernel. So uses a new new feature called struct ops in, 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 uh, in BPF. And now you have a new scheduler running and you can take over all, all of what, what Linux kernel scheduler is doing. Um, the really big piece for us is that allows this rapid experimentation. So as I mentioned, you don't need to do any reboot. You just recompile your program and, and go. Um, this is a huge win for us trying to run across a bunch of machines if I need to reboot them all. Um, I, I don't even have to stop the running workload, right? I can just unload the scheduler, it'll fall back to CFS. I get a new one, I, I, I will deploy it. Uh, the workload keeps running just as before. Um, the API is quite nice. Uh, uh, I know that's fairly subjective, but um, it, it, it's a lot simpler than the kind of the core Linux uh, uh, APIs around scheduling. Um, uh, there's a lot of heavy lifting done for you already in the APIs. And as I mentioned, you have a lot of safety here, right? So like BPF on the one hand, make sure that you can't write a scheduler that like corrupts memory, which is nice. Um, and uh, there's uh, some watchdog that will disable your scheduler if, if you're not running some, some tasks for, for a configurable amount of time. Um, and also there's just you know, a key you can hit if you, you need to kick your scheduler out if something isn't running well. Um, another big win is that it moves a lot of the complexity into user space. So uh, load balancing is something like classically pretty complicated in the kernel and trying to figure out how much load is on each core, how much load should I take away. You have to play around with the fact that like using floating point is not something you oftentimes have the ability to do in the kernel. If you move all that logic into user space, you can interact between user space and BPF to do load balancing uh, a lot more flexibly. Um, using standard debugging tools. I actually think this is a space the kernel's gotten a lot better more recently. There's this cool stuff like, like BPF, like Dragon, the ways to debug the kernel code um, that uh, you couldn't in the past, but um, it's really nice just to use like GDB right on a binary and, and, and debug how it works. Um, so uh, it becomes a lot more easy to kind of figure out, okay, I need to add some more data to my scheduler, have it, ex I wanna know when it's doing this kind of event or something like that. Uh, have it bump a counter from user space. I can see that, read it, print it out. Those sorts of things uh, uh, become a lot easier. Um, and then a, a, a big thing is just like the ability to share scheduling logic, right? So as I said, like if we have our own custom patch for, for our scheduler um, and uh, I wanna share it, you know, it, okay, it only works with this ver version of our kernel. Um, it can be a little tricky and, and, and things change. Here there's the kind of core functionality we get out of SCEDEX is you have an API, right? It tells you what you need to implement to be a scheduler and you can share that uh, uh, pretty easily. People can load it, experiment on their own machine pretty, pretty easily. All right, uh, next section, I'm gonna get into like how to actually build schedulers with SCEDEX. Uh, uh, I 
debated a little bit about like whether or not I should put code on slides um, and decided some of the code is short enough that it is worth putting on the slides to show exactly how short it is. Uh, I made that decision before I saw how large the screen was. So uh, my apologies to people particularly in the back that you, you may not be able to see things, but you'll get a sense of how large the code is, I hope. Um, so uh, very concretely, like what do you do? You, you create a BPF program, it fills out a struct with function pointers. Those function pointers are callbacks, right? So the kernel is going to call those functions at certain points during, during the process of scheduling. Uh, and you tell the kernel what to do, right? So uh, those callbacks are things like task wake up, right? Like the task was blocked reading on a socket, let's say, suddenly that socket has data. It is now uh, awoken. What, what do you want to do with it? What core should handle this wake up? Um, and Q and DQ, so when, when a, 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 core, a, a task is runnable, um, what do you want to do with it, right? Mm. And then all sorts of state changes of tasks you get notified of. Usually these are helpful for just you know, accounting that you might want to do in, in, in the kernel, know when something is runnable, know when something's actually running, uh, and do all sorts of your own statistics inside your kernel. Um, there's cgroup integration is built in. There's a bunch of callbacks. I won't cover everything here, but uh, uh, it's a fairly complete set of, of what you can do. Um, and then there's also like a bunch of fields you fill out in the struct that are not function pointers, but they sort of define, say, the timeout threshold at which point your schedule will be evicted, what the name of the scheduler is, stuff like that. How visible is, is this, just out of curiosity? Can people relatively far back see anything? Okay, cool. All right, uh, th this, this is more code than I wanted to show. This is more of an eye chart, but uh, uh, I just wanted to show like exactly what it looks like, right? There's three function pointers at the top, one is what is this, select CPU, right? That's, you know, a, a, a task is woken up, right? Figure out what to do with this task. In queue, right, this, this task is, is uh, ready to be run. What do, what do you want to do with it? Um, dispatch is, is a, a pretty common one. Uh, uh, the CPU has nothing to run. What do you want me to do, right? Um, and uh, uh, all of these have default implementations, so you don't need to necessarily implement all of these. But uh, any kind of sufficiently complicated schedule will probably implement these three, uh, w would be my guess. Um, dispatch queues, if there's like one thing you want to know about like how to actually use SCEDEX, you need to understand dispatch queues because it's sort of the, the core data structure that, that everything works. So rather than you telling the kernel, okay, run this thread, pull it off this queue, move, move this around, um, there's some uh, a, a, co a core data stru structure that, that is offered for you called the dispatch queue. And this is really the building block for all these policies. So every core has their own dispatch queue that is implicit in the system um, and has special name SCX dis DSQ local. Um, and whenever you put a task on that dispatch queue, when the thread, when that core is about to uh, uh, look for something to execute, it'll check that local queue. It's all done for you. We'll check that local queue, pull something off of it, uh, and execute. Um, but otherwise, you can create arbitrary numbers of dispatch queues. You can put stuff on it from any core. Uh, the core you know, logic of, of uh, SCEDEX will deal with locking and all that sort of stuff for you. Um, and you can do stuff like per NUMA node dispatch queues or a global dispatch queue or per C group dispatch queue, like however you want to structure your logic uh, as, as you want. Um, and uh, uh, Kernel will, you, you then sort of migrate stuff between the, the dispatch queues here and, and the kind of local dispatch queues to actually get them to execute. So I'll, I'll give an example. Um, so here I'm just showing local dispatch queues are really like, this is ultimately what the kernel is looking, uh, looking at. So anything you put on the local dispatch queue uh, uh, will get executed. All right, so I'll give an example, right? So I want to write a scheduler that just any time there's a thread to run, I put it in a global dispatch queue that all the cores contribute to. And whenever a core is idle, I'm gonna pull from that global dispatch queue and just execute it, right? You might think like, hey, that's a, a pretty dumb scheduler. Like I have no cache locality. Like it's just throwing everything into a queue. Um, that I, I will like spoiler alert, like th this actually like outperforms CFS for some of our production workloads uh, uh, on some, some machines. Um, just the ability to as quickly as possible get a runnable uh, task onto a, an idle core uh, has some benefits. 
obviously you can find large enough machines where just uh, uh, the lack of a locality hurts you here. But um, this is, while a very simple scheduler, actually like production viable. So um, basically what you need to do from each core when there's a, 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 a thread that's runnable, or a task that's runnable, uh, it's gonna dispatch that to, the, to a global dispatch queue. By default, it'll just sit there, nothing will ever execute that, uh, 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 and you have to then later on dispatch that to the local dispatch queue to get the kernel to actually execute it. So here's where I'm showing code. Um, this is really all you need to do for the enqueuing side. So I, I'm showing two functions I've implemented, init and enqueue. Uh, these are two, two callbacks that, that you have to uh, enable in uh, getx. And in init, all I'm doing is I'm creating a dispatch queue. I, I call it QID zero. Uh, and in enqueue, I'm getting a callback that this task struct P is now ready to run. What do you want to do with it? I say dispatch it to QID zero, this global dispatch queue that I've given it. And there's some flags and I, I set some slice length so that it knows how long it's supposed to run it for and everything. But um, uh, that's really all the code that is required for enqueuing onto a global dispatch queue. All right, so the other side is like, once it's on that global dispatch queue, how do I actually get the CPUs to execute it when they are about to run idle? So um, the, the, the cores here consume tasks, uh, this, this function is called consume, kind of takes a task from a, a dispatch queue and puts it on the local dispatch queue uh, uh, to actually execute it. So, uh, the yeah, sorry, and, and queue them onto the local dispatch queue as I said. Um, the code for doing that is equally quite small. Uh, uh, in dispatch, that's a callback that is called when uh, uh, you're about to go idle. Um, you call scxppf consume, give the same queue ID, that's gonna put it on the local queue and, and uh, uh, allow it to be executed. Uh, I've glossed over a couple details, like you may have to be worried about, hey, if a, 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 a core goes to sleep and has nothing to do and it can't consume anything, you may need to say wake it up to execute uh, something. But uh, uh, this, this code is pretty much all you need to do for a global dispatch queue. Um, as I said, this actually worked pretty well on like single socket, single, single L3 cache machines uh, uh, that we've tested it on. Um, and we actually have a scheduler I've, I've linked to there um, uh, called SCX simple. Uh, it's literally full scheduler, 155 lines of code, uh, defining the struct, everything around it, comments, all that sort of stuff. So um, this is super simple, but like surprisingly an effective scheduler uh, on its own. Uh, I'll give a slightly more complicated example. I don't think I added code for this because it is a little more involved, but maybe I want to do something different here where uh, 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 I have you know, multiple L3 caches in my system and I find that this global queue uh, actually becomes a uh, pretty, pretty poor locality uh, uh, and drops performance quite a bit for me uh, as, as, uh, as compared to say CFS. Um, so one idea we had was, okay, I, I will have one queue for a single L3, and I may have to do load balancing across them. Um, so uh, pretty much the exact idea, but in this case I have so two sets of cores that are run on their own, say, core complex uh, uh, with their own L3. I'm gonna have the each of those dispatched to their, their own dispatch queue. Um, and then uh, uh, a core, when it, sort of needs to consume consume the next uh, um, next task. It's just going to look up what its dispatch queue should be and, and consume from that one. Um, so you can do these kinds of ar arbitrary uh, 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 sets of systems. So in this particular case, you know, I have uh, uh, basically partitioned the machine to sort of two sets of schedulers, right? Um, obviously, as, as is, this would not be work conserving, right? I may have overloaded one set of the uh, cores with a bunch of tasks, that's dispatch queue gets super full while the other one is idle. So you have to do all sorts of interesting logic here, like, okay, I want to maybe steal from the other dispatch queue if there's nothing else going on here because uh, uh, I have spare compute to, to execute. Um, maybe only special tasks you want to, to steal. Um, there's all sorts of different ways to do it. We've, we've got a couple schedulers that do stuff like this. 
Um, and uh, there's a lot of knobs. You can play around with them and see what works well for your workload. Um, kind of the, the whole idea for us is that Skedek lets us experiment with these sorts of different policies really quickly. It's just a new parameter we pass in and uh, we get to see how it works. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about example schedulers we already have. I should say uh, we have some Meta developed schedulers. So uh, uh, these are ones our team at Meta has developed. We also have some people externally have developed a number of schedulers. I'll, I'll talk about those as well. Um, I will be very brief about what all these different schedulers are. Uh, Rusty is actually fairly simple to what I just, uh, fairly similar rather uh, to what I just talked about uh, as a, a kind of per CCX scheduler, but it does load balancing on top, a lot of different policies on top. Um, was also a, a demonstration of uh, our ability to write Rust code in user space. Uh, uh, um, and you have that be where all the load balancing actually happens. Um, simple, I actually touched on it is just that global dispatch queue has, has a little bit more in there, but not much. Um, flat CG is, is uh, a scheduler that uh, uh, kind of tries to optimize uh, C group fairness. Um, kind of one thing we've, we've observed a lot in production is uh, the CPU controller adds quite a bit of overhead trying to ensure fairness. Flat CG sort of tries to fudge the numbers a little bit on exactly how much we provide each C group but ends up being a lot more efficient in, in its scheduling. Um, and layered is a, a, a relatively new scheduler we've worked on that uh, allows us to do like really a kind of like handcrafted policies. Like I want, you know, threads named like foo uh, to run on these cores and keep them, you know, keep those cores hot to 80% and then run everything else over here. And you can do all sorts of policies uh, uh, to kind of affinitize stuff to different cores without it needing to be super strict. Um, SCX Rustland is, is uh, by An Andrea, who, who uh, uh, works at Canonical, uh, is a pretty cool scheduler uh, that he worked on. I'll, I'll show a little demo from him. Um, and uh, the whole idea here is uh, prioritizes interactive workloads over more CPU intensive workloads. Is, is very uh, uh, kind of intense about doing that. Um, uh, let me see if I can, there's a video I want to show. I will hope that this works. Uh, should hopefully be self-explanatory, but he's the whole idea, it's hopefully visible, whole idea of this scheduler um, is if you're running two different things on a machine, one you really want to run well when someone's interacting with it, one you care a lot less about, like say compiling the kernel, um, can you prioritize the, the more interactive workload? And he, he shows some pretty cool results here. So here he starts kernel build. He's now running a game, and this is with CFS. It is very choppy, pretty low frame rate. Finds it's, it's hard to enjoy. All right, he then, just from user space, sudo SCX Rustland right, runs his scheduler. It's now running. Compilation is still going. It's a lot smoother, 60 frames per second. Uh, just by changing the scheduler, right? And, and you can do that fully at runtime. Um, so this is cool. A lot of people in, in, into games have been interested in SCEDEX just because you can kind of optimize frame rates of, ga of, of, of these things um, that you couldn't before. Um, so this is a cool demo from him. All right, so uh, I'll, I'll wrap up pretty soon, uh, uh, talk about kind of current status and, and, and our next plans. Um, so uh, most important to us uh, you know, at, at, at Meta when we, we work on Linux, we have this upstream first philosophy. Um, generally speaking, whenever we find bugs in the kernel, we first try to merge the, the bug fixes upstream uh, and then only then uh, uh, use them internally, any new features, that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, and the, the rationale for that is it really allows us to like follow the upstream kernel pretty closely, right? So uh, every time we want to update our kernel, well, it's, it's not a big difference from what we're running internally to what is running upstream because any changes we've made went upstream first. Uh, has a lot of value also to get uh, upstream uh, feedback on, on all of our work. Um, 
SCEDEX is not yet upstream, but this is sort of our, our top priority. So uh, still iterating a lot with members of the upstream community to get feedback. Part of the reason we're you know here is, is trying to convince people that SCEDEX is useful, right? And you can write schedulers and, and we wanna build a community around it. Um, I, I've linked to the latest uh, uh, V5 patch set and there's a bunch of new features in there, uh, adding both BPF features and stuff like that. Uh, team from Google uh, uh, made a public commitment to, to building their own kind of extensible scheduling framework on top of SCEDEX. We've been working with them uh, uh, on some of that. So uh, we're pretty excited about kind of expanding the use case here. Um, there's a lot of new features that we could build uh, uh, a lot in the BPF space. Uh, you know, want to make it easier and easier to implement logic. We've done a lot of stuff like you can now add spin locks in BPF and, and uh, you can uh, ref count data structures and stuff like that. Uh, and it will make sure that, you know, you, you, your code is still safe. You still, uh, you know, it will fail if you fail to unlock, uh, for example, a data structure or a spin lock. Um, a lot of new schedulers we're looking at, powerware stuff, uh, uh, various like latency, latency nice properties, right? So giving more latency sensitive workloads, more power, uh, soft affinity, right? Trying to isolate cores uh, are all sorts of things we've been looking at and, and we're trying to expand the number of schedulers we have, try to find what works best for our workloads. Um, and a whole different, uh, whole, whole slew of these BPF fe features we've talked about. Uh, there's a bunch of links. I'm not sure any of this is visible, but uh, the main repo is on GitHub. This is where we maintain the Linux kernel patches. We then also have this example, the third link actually, uh, uh, is where we keep all the schedulers we, m we have been maintaining. People can contribute to them. We, we uh, uh, kind of managing this, this repository of a bunch of different schedulers that people can check out and play around with. Um, and there's a link to documentation there as well. Uh, that's it for my talk, so I'm happy to, to take questions now. I don't see a microphone, so if you just want to shout, I can... Uh, oh. I'm curious when the um, virtual machine loads the new scheduler policy, a scheduler is clearly already running. So how does that switch over happen? Yeah, so you, it's, so there's actually like multiple schedulers in Linux at any one time. You, you have like the FIFO scheduler and uh, the, they're like layered in some way to say like, okay, if the FIFO scheduler has something to run, run that before CFS. Uh, so, in the hierarchy, like like SCEDEX sits there and if there's something loaded, it will run stuff. But uh, you fundamentally need to change a thread and say like, or change a task and say, this task is now no longer running on CFS, it's now running on SCEDEX. There's a helper function actually in, in uh, SCEDEX to do that when we load the program. So very common is that you load the scheduler and one of the first things the scheduler does is switch all the tasks to start running with SCEDEX. Um, and that will change them from running in CFS to running in SCEDEX, and now all the tasks are gonna have the callbacks there for, for SCEDEX, and, and it'll start running, and as soon as it exits, it'll move them back to, to, to CFS. So technically, both schedulers are running at the same time, it's just usually it doesn't make a ton of sense to have uh, uh, you know, a, a bunch of tasks on either scheduler, because neither scheduler is usually aware of what the other's doing, and you don't want them competing. Exactly. Uh, it's not, it does not freeze everything as it's going. It's not like a super cheap operation, but like it, like we, we are doing this while production workloads are running. It's not like visible while, while that's happening. Benchmarks on like the effect of other processes, especially at the for like kernel functions for interrupt handling of like high throughput networking, high throughput uh, disk I/O. Is there any impact to having you know some stuff in this scheduler and the other stuff in that? And then my second question was, have you tried running Cave Workers in your using SCEDEX? 
Yeah, so uh, 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 to the first question, uh, uh, obviously, or ultimately like really care about is like app and end application performance, right? So, uh, uh, which is like a very complicated, like we get one number, right? Like how many you know, requests were served by my web server. And if that goes up, great. If it goes down, like terrible, right? Um, we've played around with a bunch of different schedulers. As I said, SCX simple, like was 1%-ish uh, uh, performance improvement over CFS on some of our production hardware, not all of it. Um, we've got other schedulers that, you know, configurations to SCX layered, for example, that we find uh, similar kind of performance wins across more servers. Uh, we haven't looked at specifically like high throughput networking or anything like that. Um, one thing we've been finding a lot of is uh, uh, kind of trying to isolate disparate workloads across disparate cores is really valuable. Um, so put my, you know, my web server threads here, whereas, you know, I have like background threads doing a lot of work, don't even try to share the same cores, like actually try to isolate them to separate groups of cores, uh, ends up having like uh, uh, nice locality properties and, and wins for those. Um, the second question was key workers. Uh, 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 so cer certainly most of the time when we're experimenting, we move all the tasks over to uh, 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 SCEDEX. So they would be running under it. Uh, a lot of K workers are pinned to a core, so like not not super use interesting from a scheduling perspective. It's like, oh, I'll run it on that core, right? Uh, but um, we haven't ex explicitly experimented with like moving K workers around in any any particular way. So you mentioned that you right now all of them just basically immediately move all tasks over to the SCEDEX. Do you have any sort of intelligence where you basically ignore real time uh, threads? and don't move them, because that would not probably be what you want. Yeah, like, yeah, I, I, I believe the, like, the, the function in, in it will only move, like, default class uh, yeah. stuff that runs under SCEDEX over to, uh, um, uh, to the SCEDEX class to, to make them run, like, leave real time untouched. Um, it, it's like, we are not often running real-time threads in production. It's just like hard for us to reason, like hard for any scheduler to reason about like multiple schedulers running at the same time unless you're like partitioning cores in some way. So uh, at least in, in our experiments, it's not been something we've played around with, but if you do have real-time, they will remain real-time and, and, and keep running. Do you think this could be potentially used for testing programs under different execution orders? Yeah, it's, it's something we've, we've looked at a, a little bit. Uh, uh, so so the idea, I, uh, like just to elaborate on the idea, tell me if I'm, I'm, I'm misrepresenting it, but um, like, you know, let's say I have like, like uh, a multi-threaded application and uh, uh, under some interleaving of threads, like it fails. Uh, how would I uncover that uh, uh, um, uh, with just running a scheduler? You just run the, like a ton of times and try to hope that like eventually you get the bad interleaving. But if you actually have the scheduler uh, uh, capable of doing it. Um, uh, yeah, I, I do think it's, it's viable. Like you, uh, what I'm familiar with, a lot of the techniques that like explore this, do this basically in user space. They like in, in interleave it uh, themselves. I'm not sure there's huge advantages to doing it in SCEDEX versus in user space, and, uh, but um, would definitely be a way to like explore the different interleavings probably want to have like application level uh, information anyways to know like, okay, now I'm hitting a critical section. Let me like make a scheduling decision. Uh, uh, so, um, but it's definitely been a, an idea we've, we've thought through a little bit. Anything else? Cool. Thanks so much. Uh,